Hello, all my sweet little fable baby marshmallows, and welcome to Storytime, the holy grail for great stories from around the interwebs, brought to you by iHeartRadio and Collab. I'm your host, Will Fun Uncle McFadden. Today's show is going to touch on something that most of us have, family. Love them or hate them, you're stuck with them. Though, I'm pretty sure there is some sort of legal option to unfamily your family. Perhaps I should look into that with mother, but... Then whose feet would I rub while watching old reruns of Murder, she wrote. Anyways, I'm actually back in my hometown right now of Scratch Ankle, Alabama, with mother and most of my family for somewhat of a reunion. And by reunion, I mean funeral. My great-aunt's cousin's daughter's in-law's cousin's twice removed passed away last week. Totally unexpected. Some incident involving a weed whacker, a squirrel, an ice cube tray, and a fuzzy navel wine cooler, something like that. Not really sure. I wasn't really listening, but it seemed tragic. So we are actually getting ready to head over to the viewing and the service with all of my extended family. So I thought it best to bring you guys along for the ride and see if we can put the fun in funeral. By the way, how how the hell do you tie a tie? Like, who invented these things? It's like a friggin' puzzle on my throat. Mom? Mom, can you help me with this, please? Or I don't know. I got to guys, I got to go get some assistance or look up a YouTube tutorial or something because this is boggling my mind. So why don't you listen to our first story told by my favorite family on TikTok, the McFarlands. We're going to tell you the story of how we almost made it to family feud. Almost is the key word there, dad. (laughs) It was my fault. It was that one hundred percent dad's fault. But we'll get into it. We'll get into it. We're gonna we're gonna go right into this story. Tell you you know how we ended up here. And she's. I mean, starting off, we honestly we think we'd be a good family for Family Feud. We were, and I I <laughs> we sent were. an email. Yeah, we were a good choice. Didn't make it. <laughs> okay, so mom was actually the one who discovered that Family Feud was going to be in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where we were born and raised, still live. She heard it on the radio, and she was like, you know what? Let's do it. She told us, and we said, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> mom submitted a bio for us and everything. She wrote it up. Beautiful, sweet, sweet little mom bio. <laughs> sweet mom bio. Well, then they sent us back an invitation and a spot, so we all got super excited to go. Mom, it got there. That's mom always does that little voice. But so we were actually pretty excited. We thought, you know, this is a cakewalk. We're nuts. We can just walk right in here and just be, you know, ourselves. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And just to set the scene for everyone listening right now, it's not like we're in a studio in L.A. This is a little convention center in downtown Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. So we pull up to the convention center where well, where they have the fair, the Kentucky State Fair. It's where they have the tractor pole. <laughs> we, where they have the tractor, and we literally get so dressed up. I don't know why we got so dressed up. We're going to Family Feud to like we know the type of questions they ask. We're gonna get in our church clothes and go down here in our little suits. <laughs> I thought Steve Harvey would be there. <laughs> yeah, we were dressing to impress Steve yeah, for sure. We just, we thought Steve would be there. He was not, sad, like sadly enough. So we go, we get, we go park in, park in the parking garage, and we're just waiting in line for about forty five minutes. We got spotted in line by like one of the Family Feud workers. <laughs> they came up to us and said, like, you know what? We see you guys having fun. They gave us, they wrote our names down. What else did they do, mom? They definitely stopped and they paid attention and they <laughs> said, "Come in, because you guys are going to be in this room." And this is like seven years ago, so this is a while ago. <laughs> this is. We should have gotten to that earlier, but yes, this was like seven years ago. So we're in line. We finally get to the room. There's like 500 people in this room. Yeah, the 500 people in one room, and then there was a separate room with 500 more people. But <laughs> I didn't know there was the this point. many people in Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> and they all want to be on Family Feud. So yeah, we, were, what, well, we were confused how they all found out about it. <laughs> like, there's so many people in this room, but like... We barely found out about it, so how did all these people get the get the memo? <laughs> so here we are watching all these mock trial runs of a, like a family feud round. Steve Harvey's not there. It's some fraud. I'm not. It's not a fraud. Okay, it's just like a, a makeshift Steve Harvey. They're up there. They're they got standing. They're a stand in. It, it's just like a lady in like sweatpants. It's, uh, it's they're like they're just trying to get their day over with. Like this is just their job to go interview a bunch of random families. Okay, and we are one of those random families. But, 
We waited our turn. We finally get the McFarlane's come on down. So we run up there, all excited, like we're on the real show. <laughs> <laughs> Already practiced our lines and everything. Woo-hoo! It's been funny. And we get up there, and yeah, it's just like tables. It's just like the picnic tables, the plastic picnic tables. They, they just fold out, and there's no buzzers, no nothing. So they ask you your questions, and all you're supposed to do is just slap the table. And I guess the lady is just like, you know what? Okay. You slapped it first. It's literally just like a grade school game (laughs) (laughs) in front of hundreds of people. So we're playing another family. It's like the Johnsons or something. Like, come on, we got to be better than the Johnsons, right? That's what we were thinking the whole time. We're watching all these mock runs. Like, we're better than this. We can we can nail some answers. Oh yeah. So, first question. Here we go. We're, We're we're going right for it. The question is, name something that only comes out at night. And I mean, dad's hand slapped that table so fast. I don't even, She didn't even finish the question. And dad slapped that table. I'm going to see if I can get the audio here. It's almost like this. <laughs> like it owed him money. <laughs> like it owed him money. And what did you say, dad? Moths. <laughs> My man said moths. And like, they said, did you say moths? <laughs> Yes! He said moss like it was 100% correct. <laughs> and we're supposed to all go, good answer, good answer! And I, I mean, heard crickets. <laughs> that's what we did all yell good answer. We're the only ones in the room yelling good answer because it's just our family. But he's not wrong. Moths do come out at night, but he wasn't on the list. So, get to pass, to the, <laughs> pass to the other family. They nail it. They're just crushing it with, like, vampires, the moon. the moon. Everyone's like, wow, these people are smart. McFarlane's are not... Or not, especially that dad. <laughs> Jeez. So, next question. Here we go. Classic family feud style question. You know, where they, they get a little... They, they want you to say the raunchy answer. Yeah. It's entrapment. It's, it's it, entrapment. They really do. Steve, what are you doing there? Like, come on. But, question is, name something that everyone knows the size of on their body. Okay? Like... It is a little bit of entrapment. Like, of course you're going to say some weird stuff at that one. And expect. so dad got the first one wrong. Mom slaps it. She gets this. And she says, like, just a genius answer. What do you say, Mom? Your shirt size. She says, your shirt size. Um, it's right. Yeah. It's right. Ding, ding, ding. So we'll play. We, we'll play. We'll play. We'll play. Yeah. We'll play, Steve. We'll play. We'll play. We'll play. Steve. Great answer. Great answer. <laughs> Question gets passed to Mitch. He's next in line. He's the oldest brother. So Mitch says... Said your waistline. Everyone knows that. Great answer. Great Good answer. answer. Good answer. Great answer. Good answer, Good answer, Good answer, answer Mitch. Good answer. So he's right too. He's right. All right, we're on a roll here. We're feeling pretty hot right now. Let's go, McFarlane. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> and it comes to Dylan, and I'm gonna let Dylan just tell tell you what happened. I'm like, oh. it comes down the line to eighth grade Dylan, who's thinking, Mom said shirt size. Mitch said waist size, so all the good answers are taken. What do I say? I don't know any other measurements. So, eighth grade Dill says, "Your wiener, <laughs> <laughs> your wiener." In this room of five hundred people, in the Kentucky Convention Center, erupts. It's electric. The, the room the is room. just. <laughs> The electric. room is electric. <laughs> oh, it, the people are roaring. Like this, this curly-haired little eighth-grade kid just said, "Your wiener in a suit." In this a little suit <laughs> looks like he just got done with church, and now he's over here shouting "wiener" in front of a, full, a room full of people. You know, I still remember. I'll never forget this. A guy in the very front row was sitting next to his wife, and he looked at me and he pointed and said, "You are the man. You're the <laughs> man." <laughs> Family feud. Oh man. Our finest hour. So, jeez. Good answer. Great answer. Great. Right, yeah. Honestly, so I, I don't even know if that answer was right. I think they just gave it to him because everyone laughed. It was just a funny answer. So, like, you know what? Let's see what else. Like, what's what's the last kid got to say? So, it comes to me, Colin. And, um, God, I mean, my head's in the gutter now because Dylan just said wiener. What am I supposed to say? I could have said shoe size because that also would have been right. But, oh, man. I said... Your cup size. Oh, and he did the hand motions and too. I, like, I mean, I didn't. I had to make the hand motion like like over my breasts because I didn't want people to think I meant like jock strap cup. Like, did you have to honk them though? I didn't honk them. <laughs> I did not honk them. <laughs> I didn't want people to think I was talking about an athletic cup. Okay. <laughs> so everyone's like, McFarlane's are weird. 
That's a fact. <laughs> These are my guys. Yeah. Mom, yeah. They're like, and the they're parents are yelling, good answer, good answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, dad's face is just oh beat red. God. And stand-in Steve is just like, what is going on? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so we finish our round. You know, we get some high fives going back to our seats. And then after the fact, it, you know, we get pulled to the back. And they want us to do a, a mock videotaped interview yeah. where the whole family just introduces themselves. And it's like, I guess it's gonna, what they're going to show to the Family Feud team. Yeah. We got, so it's like almost like the final interview before you really get on the show. Boy, oh boy, we should not have stepped foot in this room because <laughs> this is where we blew it. And I mean, it's more specifically where dad blew it. I saw a big camera with a lot of lights and microphones, and I froze. Dad did freeze. So freeze. He went to straight panic Dad, mode. <laughs> you wouldn't. You wouldn't think it, but he's been on the camera quite for the for the last couple of years on TikTok, Instagram, everything. I mean, we make some videos now. But starting off, you Ooh. put a camera in this guy's face. It's like he short circuits, like you just dump water on a MacBook or something. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the question? Kyle? Question was literally it wasn't even a question. It was just like, hey Dan, like you're the patriarch of the family. Tell us like your name and then a little bit about yourself. Introduce your family. Literally, it. All you had to say was like, I'm Dan from Louisville, Kentucky. Just uh, had to introduce yourself. That's all you had to do. And my family. And my family. Here's my three boys. We're so happy to be here. Literally. That's all you could have said. That's supposed to be it. And okay, so dad, when he freaks out on camera and he, like, people ask him a question, he just rambles, like, rambles so hard. He goes off the rails. Off the rails is, is an understatement. So yeah. he starts giving his life story saying, Oh, my name's Dan McFarland. Um, I'm from Lima, Ohio. Originally, me and my wife, um, we met when we were in grade school. And I, 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 I hit in the saw. And your teacher is Miss Crabtree. <laughs> Dude, Mitch does literally, good. You literally rambled on your entire life story. I got, I got hit in no, the head I, with a softball when I was in fifth grade. No, and then I did so goofy, not. And then, in the middle of him rambling, you can just see him start to think, how am I going to get out of this? Like, <laughs> And you kept going and going and, and Mitch, going. you and I were on the end, and Colin and Dylan were in the middle, and you or I would have kicked him. But neither one of them did anything. But we're all just sitting there staring at Dad. As and he looking knows down the, line. down the line, everybody's eyeballing him. He's like, how am I going to end this? He was he was in too deep to get himself out. He really was. So, oh, man. We almost had it. We really almost had it. Dylan said Wiener, you know, 500 people were watching him. They were laughing. You know, we were, we were really killing it. We were going to be on Family Feud if we could just say, I'm Dan McFarlane, and here's my sons and my beautiful wife. Literally it! We would have been on the show! Yeah, I mean, I, I think the moral of the story is your wiener will get you to the back room, but don't let your dad find out about it. <laughs> That's so weird. Like, we're still being weird and yeah. for more people to hear. We need to chill out. We still need to get on Family Feud. Yeah. We do. We we will hopefully one day we'll get our redemption and we'll be able to get on Family Feud with Steve Harvey. Did I ever apologize to the family? Uh, oh, did we? I'm sorry. Can you apologize? Did we tease you about it endlessly. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Can we can we get a formal apology from you for that? Right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm cured. Geez. Dad, dad is dad's. I, I, I'll. He's sorry. I am sorry. He's <laughs> still haunted. Dad, you're still haunted by this story. Oh, man. It's okay. We love telling the story to our family and friends just so that they can make fun of us, too. Um, we hope you enjoyed it because, I mean, as soon as we left that room, you know, we were pretty embarrassed, but we laughed so we laughed hard. All the way home. It was so funny. <laughs> we seriously cried laughing in that car ride home. More of the story, just go out there and do some fun stuff with your family. You know what? Create some memories. Hey, it's story time. Go, you got to make some stories somehow, right? I mean, That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, um, I guess thanks for listening to our story. We're the McFarlane's just sitting around our dining room table right now, yeah. kind of just goofing. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you. <laughs> Give me a kiss, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Handsome Will. Uh, we love you, Will. We love story time. If you're not listening to story time, get with the program. Turn it on. I don't even know. Got to make stories to tell stories. <laughs> God, that's right. Love you. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. That's a good line. Oh, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the love and the shout out there at the end. Uh, you know, I don't think I've ever kissed an entire family before. But hey, it's first for everything. And for the record, 
Wiener is the correct number one answer for that question. Steve Harvey, if you're listening right now, which you probably are, give the McFarlands a chance at redemption and bring them on the feud. Now go down to that description and clink on those links and give the McFarlands a follow for more family fun. All right, guys, so I couldn't figure out the stupid tie, but luckily I packed a backup bolo. So I am looking sharp and I am ready to crush this party, gathering, funeral, whatever. Guys, I wish you could see what I'm seeing right now. This church is absolutely breathtaking. I know it's hard to believe, but the architecture in Ankle Scratch, Alabama is quite bewitching. Wait a second. Hold on. What the mother fudging heck is this? Holy shasta. There is a pre-funeral buffet here. (laughs) I know it may seem a little gauche to say this, but this may be the best funeral ever. Sausage cakes? Mmm. Mini corn dogs? Also, mmm. (gasps) Deviled eggs? Oh, hot diggity dog. You know I can never say no to a deviled egg. Wait, are they even allowed to have the eggs of the devil in church? Oh, fudge it. Who cares? They're delicious. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-hmm. That is devil paprika. Mm. Oh shit! I mean, shoot! I mean, fucking damn it! Sorry. My terrible uncle Ditchell is here, and he's heading this way right. Now. Wilbert, my boy, look at you growing outward instead of upward. I see. Oh, th- okay. <laughs> wow, thank you. That's not. I'm actually down a few pounds since the divorce. So. Oh yeah, I saw that on the tit talk. Did you just say tit talk? Yeah, it's tick talk. Not if you're doing it right. <laughs> You? Also, my TikTok's private. We don't speak. So how do you know about my divorce? Uh, I follow Sheila. Why? Oh, I'm a fan of her relatable comedy skits, and uh, she makes some pretty nifty car dashboard DIYs. Dashboard DIYs? Oh, yeah. Her newest video was great. You just cut a hole in your dashboard, and then you fill it with rocks and tiny succulents, and voila! A little car garden. A, uh, car den. <laughs> Wow, cool. That sounds really stupid and pointless, and I'd love to hear more about it right now, but I'm a little busy working, so... Oh, are you doing that podcast right now? Hey, 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 all you fable fairies, I got something you need to know about. Oh, no, hey. not this again. I've been reading some forums on Ten Chan, and you all need to know that birds aren't real. Mm-hmm. In the 1960s, the government killed off billions of birds and replaced them with surveillance drones. Have you ever seen a baby pigeon? Have I ever seen a baby pigeon? No, I actually... Yeah, because they're liars. They charge their batteries on the power lines. Wake up, sheeple! Okay, that's like... That kind of makes sense, but listen, hey, Ditchel, this is my podcast, okay? Get your own. Hey, listen... You guys also need to know that the bottlenose dolphins are just tiny submarines for Russian spot toddlers. Okay, that's enough. You will not silence me, Will. This feels like a great time to listen to our second story from Zach Clayjean, better known online as the Trap Violinist, who went on a magical mystery tour with his dad. Ditchel, can you back away from the deviled eggs, please? My dad has always been an enigma to me. I was only three when he had to move away for work, and shortly after that, my mom and him split. I really didn't see him too much growing up, and I only really got to know him at random points in my life. By the time I turned 11, he'd left his university research job and his second wife to go, quote, wherever the wind takes him, end quote. His new main goal, instead of breaking the second law of thermodynamics, was to find or start a community not bound by the poles of modern society. Think Henry David Thoreau, or perhaps the classic Mormon lifestyle. Living off the land, barting for goods and services, collecting rainwater for showers. You know the drill. Or maybe you think you do. Today, I'm going to regale you with a story unlike any other. Featuring me, a pretty regular high school kid who is about to get fleas, my dad, an MIT grad slash hippie vagabond, and our cross-country mode of transportation, a green and purple school bus named Shadow Slow. My story begins the summer after my freshman year in high school, with me lying in a hospital bed. It'd been 12 hours since I severed my jaw from a wicked bike accident, and I had surgery in the morning. That's a story for another time. But I was feeling pretty low, and my mom came in the room and told me my dad was on the phone. She put him on speaker because I could barely move. I heard his voice and recognized it immediately. 
I heard you're going to have your teeth wired shut for about a month, he said. I grunted in pain and acknowledgement. When you heal up, he continued, I'm taking you on an adventure. So after spending a month eating hamburger milkshakes and hiding in my room smoking weed at the side of my mouth, 14-year-old me hopped on a Greyhound bus from Georgia and made my way out to old Rocky Top, where I was met with my first surprise of what was about to be an unforgettable trip. I'm not sure what I expected my dad to be driving these days, but it wasn't this. The purple and green painted school bus stood out like a sore thumb amidst the other cars with Tennessee license plates, and I could feel every eye in the station on me as the wheels pulled up at my feet. On one side of the bus there was an assortment of vegetables painted, and on the other a mural of an old man with a wizard's hat, galloping on a white horse, with the name Shadow Slow outlined in black underneath. I recognized the mural instantly as Gandalf and his horse Shadow Fax from The Lord of the Rings, one of my dad and I's favorite movies. The bus came to a creaky stop in front of me and the doors swung open to reveal my dad in the driver's seat. It'd been a few months, maybe a year since I'd seen him last, and he looked the same with his friendly eyes, scraggly black beard, and unkempt clothes. Still feeling the gaze of my fellow travelers on the back of my neck, I boarded the bus and gave him a hug looking around at the inside of my new home. I have to admit I was pretty impressed by what he'd done with the place. It was your standard long yellow school bus that we all rode in school, but it looked like something else entirely. For starters, all the seats had been ripped out except the driver's seat, replaced with what you would normally find in a full RV. There was a lifted queen-size bed that seemed to also serve as a sitting area, a fully functional sink and stove, a compost toilet, cushioned seating, and even many shelves lined with books. Possibly the most interesting and smelly thing in there was a large vat of liquid that sat by the front. Apparently my dad, who graduated with an engineering degree from MIT, had finagled the bus to run entirely on cooking oil. Cooking oil! I took it all in for a moment as the door swung shut behind me. Where to? I asked. He grinned and put the bus in drive. Never heard of Bonnaroo? I had never been to a music festival before, and Bonnaroo 2008 with my dad was one hell of an experience. Shadow Slow was an immediate hit in the festival bus parking area, and grew daily crowds who came to take pictures with Gandalf. During the day I would sit on the roof reading and playing chess with my dad, waving and meeting all the cool festival people who came to see the bus for themselves. At night I would venture off on my own, experiencing all this new music and really just taking everything in. After a month of hiding in my room, at home, with a broken jaw and a torn up face, it was nice to feel like I was in the center of it all. The last day of the festival, my dad's friend Forrest announced he'd made it his mission to get as fucked up as possible. So, of course, I decided to try to keep up. I drank Everclear for the first time, smoked a lot of weed, and ate enough shrooms to have me walking the festival grounds talking to a penguin on my shoulder named Percival. That night, Percival and I watched Pearl Jam for the first time and found Nirvana. This was the same infamous night where Kanye West would show up late as fuck for his set, coming out at like 4 to 30 in the morning. Needless to say, uh, me and Percival did not make that performance. I woke up after that night in an absolute funk to see us already hurtling down the road. Fresh cooked eggs were sitting on the stove and the Beatles were blasting over the speakers. I raised my head to see my pops driving a few feet away. You've been cooped up for a month, looking like sloth from the Goonies, my dad joked, noticing I was up. It's about time you see another slice of life. Say goodbye to your cell phone service and hello to Mother Earth. I don't know whether it was the hangover mixed with the motion of the bus or the dread of going without my cell phone for who knows how long, but upon hearing this... I ran to the compost toilet and threw up magic mushrooms. We spent that summer completely off the grid, visiting communes throughout the country that were living alternatively to mainstream society. I learned how to tend garden, build structures, and live completely free of technology. At times we stayed in nudist colonies, took part in rituals with cult-like groups, and even got into disagreements over precious resources with neighboring communities. People didn't have jobs or mortgages or bills. They had skills. 
They worked to keep their lands, tend to their animals, and support each other. Even with no societal responsibilities, there was still a sense of purpose. It was truly unlike anything I'd ever experienced before in my little suburban bubble around Atlanta. And it was actually during this time that I really fell in love with writing music. Armed with only my iPod mini shuffle, teenage angst, and a lack of cell service in the middle of nowhere, I listened to my library of emo rock on repeat and decided that someday I was going to be a musical artist too. So at this point in the story, it's been all fun and games and happy times and blah, blah, blah. And that's been true and and great. But, you know, every story needs a low point. And I have to tell you guys about the low point of this trip. And that was me catching fleas. With one week left in our journey to find hippie land, my dad had one last stop for us to make before my return to the real world. We parked the bus in Arkansas and trekked two days up and down the Ozarks until we got to our destination, a commune known only as the Valley of Light. Now, the valley was home to two residents, a woman and her dog, and long story short, somehow I ended up sleeping in a dog's bed. Apparently no one noticed, including myself, for like a couple days until I started getting these little itchy bumps on my skin. My MIT grad dad shrugged it off as allergies or mosquitoes and sent me off on a plane to New Orleans, where my grandparents were waiting. By this second night, my grandparents' entire house, my grandparents themselves, and me were infested with a freshly hatched colony of fleas. It got so bad we had to fumigate the entire house and stay at one of their friends' places. I literally still have PTSD from those little monsters biting and jumping all over me as I tried to sleep. All in all, it was a summer I'll never forget, and a summer I think I needed. My dad may not have spent a lot of time with me growing up, but he sure did make the time we spent together memorable. I'm thankful for the experience because I was able to see a completely different side of life than I or my friends were used to. I was able to come out of my shell and grow in ways that I didn't even know I needed to at the time. After my bike accident, I wanted to hide from the world in in fear. But by the end of this trip... I was excited to keep taking risks and experience everything life had to offer, as long as it wasn't fleas. Man, what a crazy summer. Whatever happened to Shadow Slow, the bus? You know, I've been thinking about moving out of my mom's house and living that van life. So I'm an interested buyer, as long as it's d fleed You can find Zach, a.k.a. the Trap Violinist, links in the description. Click them. Okay, so we're actually in the service right now, but no one's paying attention to me anyways. Except, there's like this fairly attractive lady right in front of me. She keeps turning around and making eyes at me, like, eyes. But I think I might be related to her, so that's a little weird. Oh, she's looking again. Excuse me? Oh, uh, yes? Yeah, hi. You have egg on your face. Egg? Yeah, like a lot of egg. It's in your mustache, and I think there's some in your eyebrows. It's really disgusting. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, well, you know what they say. Egg on my face. <laughs> you guys, I think she is into me. It's probably the bolo tie. Hey, shh, you shush! Okay, got it. Thank you. I'm sorry, the shush police have arrived. So, here's a story from a creator named Naira who shares a painful memory about a family vacation to the so-called happiest place on Earth. As a child, everybody thinks their parents are cool, but I knew it, okay? I had a leg up on the other kids. Growing up, my dad was a famous DJ, but not like a party DJ. We're talking real old school hip hop turntablism DJ, and it was the coolest thing in the world. But he was also somebody that was really, really passionate about civil rights, a social justice warrior, if you will, which is really, really dope and really admirable until it gets you kicked out of one of the best amusement parks in the world. But to be fair, that guy was literally asking for it. So one day my parents tell my sister and I that we're going on vacation, a week-long trip at 
every child's dream destination in the magical Orlando, Florida. And they were even bringing our cousins along. We were over the moon. We were so ecstatic about it. And at this time in my life, the coolest thing in the world to me was this children's movie about these big animatronic bears that sang country music. And to a little girl that lives in New York City, what's cooler than the country? We arrived at the park, checked into our hotel, and my parents bought us autograph books at the gift shop because the costume characters roamed around the park and would sign autographs for all the children. So day two rolls around and I spot one of them. I spot one of the bears from my favorite movie and I lost it. Nobody in the world could have convinced seven-year-old me that if I didn't get that autograph, I was going to literally die. My parents walked us over and there was already a small crowd of kids waiting to get autographs from the bear. So we stood around for a few moments and we waited. And then we stood around for another few moments and we waited. And then we stood around for some more moments and we waited. And then my parents noticed a pattern. The bear, or rather the person in the bear costume, was only acknowledging a certain kind of people. You see where this is going. The guy was only talking to white people, okay? He was only signing the autographs of white children. And every family of color, every black family, was just standing there being completely ignored and kind of like hovering, trying to get the guy's attention. My dad was pissed. He was not having it. After a few failed attempts to trying to get the bear's attention and being ignored, My dad lost it. He's like, hey, you don't see us standing here. You haven't acknowledged any family that isn't white. And the bear, or rather the employee in the bear costumed, just kind of looked at my father and then looked away and went right back to signing the white kids autographs. Of course, the right thing to do in this situation would be to turn around and just walk away. At the most, maybe grab a supervisor or a manager and complain so that something can be done about the employee's actions. Maybe write a damn letter. But you obviously know that's not where this is going. My dear father, in front of at least 35 witnesses, attacks a theme park employee in a semi-animatronic bear costume. I wish this was a joke. I wish I could say I'm just kidding right now, but I'm not. In the typical way these things usually happen, all of a sudden a supervisor is available and in our immediate area and he rushes over to break up the incident and called security. And of course, seven-year-old me is in absolute pieces because I just watched my father attack my favorite fictional movie star. You see where this is going, right? Do I really have to tell you what happens next? Our vacation was officially over. We got escorted out of the park and we were told not to come back. They didn't care that our hotel was on theme park grounds. They didn't want to hear it. We were kicked out of the park. Looking back on it, it is something that we laugh about because, I mean, it's hysterical. A grown man attacked someone in a semi-animatronic bear costume at a children's amusement park. But as a child, the situation was so devastating to me. Not only was our vacation ruined and we had to go home early, but it was ruined not by my father, but truthfully by the employee. Even at that young age, I understood that my father's actions were a reaction and it was out of protection. And it really hurt me that because I didn't look like the other kids, I couldn't meet one of my favorite characters. But in a strange way, I wouldn't have had our vacation go any other way because I learned so much from that experience. I'm totally lying. I was seven. I just wanted to have fun on vacation with my sister and my cousins, but racism wouldn't let us be great. That story breaks my heart and pisses me off, but it doesn't surprise me. If you are surprised to hear that there is a history and culture of discrimination and racism at a certain theme park slash multinational mass media and entertainment conglomerate that shall not be named for legal reasons, then I suggest you do a little reading and educate yourself. I do really appreciate Naira sharing this family story, though, even though it's a painful one. And I would like to officially congratulate her on her beautiful newborn baby girl. Hopefully one day the world is a better place and you can take her to that theme park and she can have the experience that you were hoping for as a child. For beauty, lifestyle, and new mom content, check out Naira's YouTube and Instagram. Links in the description. She was a gentle lover of plants. So it seems like the funeral's wrapping up now. Now, if anyone would like to come up and say a few words. Oh, this is my favorite part. It's kind of like a sad version of story time. You, sir. In the uh, trench coat and fedora. Oh, sh- 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 
he talking to me? I can't be the only stylish trench coat wearing fedora sporting man in the room. Yeah, yeah. You with the uh, microphone and the Tom Selleck mustache. Oh. Seems like you'd like to say a few words. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, sure. I can say some, some words, I suppose. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate this thing called life. The life of sweet little Myrtle. Now, I didn't know Myrtle very well, but I did know she made a mean ambrosia salad. And she also loved guinea pigs. And I think that Myrtle would really love it if all of us just took a second and took out our phones and and searched story time on wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a five-star rating and a positive heartfelt review. You know, in fact, the person who, who follows us on Instagram and comments, rest in peace, Myrtle, will win a Storytime t-shirt and a $50 Amazon gift card. Oh. Mom, what the f- fudge? Boring. Are you seriously heckling me right now? What's happening? You suck. You suck. Also, make sure to follow us on TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. Oh, get off the stage. Well, that'll do it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Storytime. As always, I want to give another huge shout out to our storytellers, Naira, Zach Clayjean, and the McFarlane family. You can find links to their channels in the episode description. Hey, since I've got you here, do you want to be on an upcoming episode of Storytime? If you have a great story to tell, which I'm sure you do, type it up or send an audio file to storytime at collab.ing and we'll share our favorites on an upcoming listener episode. Storytime is produced by iHeartRadio and Collab. Executive producers Eric Jacks, Song Kang, and Will McFadden. Hosted by Will McFadden. Produced by Jessica Eccles, Jason Shapiro, Daniela Mora, and Jenny Ulmer. Written by Jenny Ulmer. Voice acting by Tom Szymanski and Jenny Ulmer. Sound design by Tony Maddox. Original score by Scott Simons. Cover art by John Kusagaya. Animation by Bella Bouchon. Bella Bouchon.